Hello, my name is Jordan Bush. I'm a master's student at the University of Kentucky in the Plant and Soil Sciences Department. Today I'm going to give everyone a brief overview of a literature review I've been working on at the request of a local farmer. While writing this literature review, I looked at the factors that influence how quickly alfalfa dries down. I also read past research that has been conducted in an attempt to predict when hay will be dry or how long it will take to do so. The ultimate goal of this literature review was to determine the feasibility of creating some sort of hay drying prediction or forecasting system for Kentucky. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the kind of AI that a lot of us use daily, such as Siri, Alexa, or Google. I know every morning I say, hey Google, what's the forecast for today? Or I ask, hey Siri, text my mom. What would it be like in the future if you could just ask, hey Siri, is my hay ready yet? So in the spirit of the purpose of this paper, I've decided to retitle this talk, hey Siri. If alfalfa drying could be predicted by simply inputting basic weather data, who says we wouldn't be able to create an app that could tell us exactly when hay would be ready for baling? I think it would be quite neat to make checking hay fields as easy as, hey Siri, is my hay ready? Growing up, horses were really my only connection to agriculture since I grew up in the suburbs. When I decided to study agronomy during my undergrad, I knew I needed more hands-on experience on a farm. So I found a listing on Craigslist for a dairy farm that was looking for a milker. In retrospect, meeting a strange man out on a farm from Craigslist was maybe not my brightest idea, but it turned out fine. It turned into this sort of unofficial internship where I learned so much more than just how to milk cows. One of the things I was most interested in was forages, and since my boss also did custom haying for other farmers, I asked him to teach me all that he could. I rode along with him one day to check hay fields. He'd pick up a handful of hay and he'd feel it and smell it and go, that's about ready. I asked him how he knew it was ready and he sort of just stared at me. It might have been the first time in my life I was face to face with a speechless farmer. <laughs> I could tell he was searching for words to explain to me what he knew from a lifetime of harvesting hay and he just couldn't find them. It was second nature to him and he couldn't easily teach me. This was one of the moments where I really understood how hard it can be for new people to get into farming and how risky it can be. This is a main factor in why this literature review was requested. How can a new farmer best know when their hay will be ready? Or how can we mitigate the risk even for experienced farmers who deal with the delicate balance of weather, crop factors, and time in order to make a living? In order to have a successful hay crop, best practices must be followed to aid dry down. Respiration doesn't cease until about 40% moisture, and until then, hay continues to eat up the nutrients that you want to preserve for your animals, so it's important to get it dried down as quickly as possible without any adverse effects. This will be discussed again later as one of the challenges to predicting dry down. Hay has to lose about 75% of its moisture to be ready for harvest, so there's different types of conditioning to aid this, and swath width and depth can also affect dry down. On the flip side, moving a hay crop around too much, especially at lower moisture contents, can lead to leaf shatter. In addition to following best practices for harvesting and handling hay, it's also important to harvest at the right time. The graph on the right is a very common one that shows the sweet spot between yield and nutritive value where hay should be harvested for the best product. Next, we are going to cover the ways that plants dry. There are three main processes that allow water to escape the plant. The process by which hay dries changes depending on the moisture content and stage of drying. At higher moisture contents, water will be lost through the stomatal openings. These are openings used by the plant for gas exchange. As you can see here, when the cells around the stoma are full of water, they stiffen so the stoma opens, which you can see on the left. As those guard cells around the stoma lose water, they relax and close the stoma like you can see on the right. This is what happens in the first stage of the dry down of hay. As the plant loses water and the stoma close, water must escape through a secondary route. The surfaces of plants are waxy, as we know, so we must rely on the openings that we create in the harvesting process to allow water to escape. This can occur through openings created by conditioning. In this figure, we can see the openings created by mechanical conditioning. We can see the cracks on the left and the scrapes on the right in the stem of the plant. 
There are also chemical conditioners on the market that can be sprayed on the plants at the time of mowing in order to decrease drying time. Once relatively little water is left in the plant, it is held much more tightly by osmotic forces. The evaporation of the remaining water is largely dependent on the surrounding environment. This is when weather factors come into effect, such as solar insulation and humidity. So a few distinct categories seem to pop up continuously in the studies I was reading. Researchers either took the single or multi-layer drying approach and conducted their experiments in a field, a lab, or a combination of the two. In the single layer drying approach, researchers view the entire swath of hay as one bulk layer that is interacting with the systems around it, such as the air and the soil or the ground. Multi-layer drying divides the system into a series of thin layers that interact with each other and with the surrounding environment. These studies tend to look into the moisture content at different depths within a pile of drying material, or in this case, the swath. Some studies used data acquired from measurements in a realistic hay field, and these studies could not control environmental factors such as wind speed or humidity. Several different types of controlled experiments have been done. Some are extremely controlled, such as those in lab drying systems that can manipulate wind speed, air temperature, humidity, etc. And then there's various other artificial drying systems that are also used, such as wind tunnels. While well, these studies that I've read approach their objective differently, some similar conclusions were drawn. Next, I'm going to give a brief synopsis of some of the papers that I found to be most helpful in understanding what environmental factors are involved in field drying of hay, as well as the challenges to predicting dry down. I've listed them in chronological order of publishing so that we can see the progression of knowledge and techniques over the years. This experiment by Kemp et al. in 1972 looked at latent evaporation as a parameter for predicting dry down. This measurement is taken using an atmometer, which is what's in the picture, and which measures the integrated effect of radiation, temperature, vapor pressure deficit, and wind velocity on the evaporation of water from a wet, horizontal, black, porous surface, which is exposed to the environment. The latent evaporation was effective in describing how the environmental conditions impact dry down, but the study was done under controlled circumstances where radiation and air velocity um, were held constant while the temperature was changed. Like the first study, these authors investigated using latent evaporation as a metric for predicting hay drying time. The prediction curves often overpredicted drying time. This was thought to be because the ambient air temperature is used in the calculations, but that isn't necessarily representative of the temperature of the swath. Especially on days with little cloud cover, that intense solar radiation can quickly heat up the surface of the swath, and we can't assume that the swath temperature and the air temperature are the same. The accumulated potential evaporation metric investigated in this study showed some promise. However, it was relatively complicated, and the authors noted that it would take a lot of simplification in order to be useful. Um, this same author, Hill, conducted another similar study published the following year using vapor pressure deficit instead of latent evaporation to predict drying time for alfalfa hay. And that study again found that unless under controlled constant conditions, the prediction equations just aren't as accurate due to the heating of the crop surface in comparison to the ambient air temperature. So up until this point, studies on things like latent evaporation and vapor pressure deficit as metrics for predicting hay drying time were not shaking out to be the best options. In this study, Ross and Chen wanted to determine what variable had the most influence on the drying rate of hay and could explain the most variance in drying time. The results suggested that solar insulation explained more variation in drying than all other measure factors combined. Those other parameters included temperature, humidity, wind, the cutting number, the maturity, soil moisture, swath density, swath surface temperature, and whether or not a chemical conditioner had been applied. Many factors are correlated with drying rate and with each other due to the similar conditions in which they exist. 
for example, it would make sense that the dry bulb, if the dry bulb temperature is higher, the swath temperature will also be higher. The authors of this paper, Gupta et al. in 1989, suggest that while thin layer drying models based on lab studies have been used, they're not capable of predicting the actual field drying time because of the effects of rain and dew. The goal of this study was to predict the moisture content at any time of the day while accounting for rain and dew. This was achieved by using different combinations of weather parameters. Um, finally, the authors wanted to be able to predict drying time for conditioned or unconditioned hay. So two separate sets of equations for rainy or non-rainy conditions were developed. These sets of calculations were actually all done in Fortran 77, and the paper from 1989, mind you, noted that the code was available upon request. So 30 years later, I tried to request it, and I was semi-successful. Um, the authors were all retired, but I managed to get a hold of one, and he let me know that he didn't have any of the code, but there was about 40 pages worth of it published in one of the original author's thesis documents. Um, I have not dug through that yet, but it's out there, so maybe it can be resurrected in the future. This study um, had a few other notable results. It was found that wind speed was non-significant, and also that higher yielding swaths tend to absorb less moisture overnight in that dew rewetting period, and only the upper layers tended to increase in moisture. Overall, the important outcome of this paper was that they created alternatives to the parameters that can be difficult to obtain, like the radiation um, or insulation. It was mentioned in the paper that their results suggested that hay that has been rewetted dries differently than hay that hasn't been rewetted. Um, the results were not conclusive enough for them to make a confirmed statement on that, but they did mention it. This next study by Irinze et al. was working on developing a model to simulate artificial drying systems, looking at factors such as the input air temperature and the fan waste heat, but they then modified it to also simulate the field drying of alfalfa in thin layers. Um, so not a whole lot else to say about that study, but just an interesting development. This 1993 study by Gisette et al. investigated similar factors to the other studies we've looked at, but they also looked into some other parameters that I had not thought of before reading this paper. Um, the researchers looked at the impact of the roughness of the surface of a pile of hay, as well as the effects of the orientation of the leaves. The roughness of the pile of the hay can affect its relationship with the airflow around it, and the orientation of the leaves can change how the radiation scatters both on the surface of the pile and between the layers within it. I think it's like the difference between a handful of glitter and a mirror. A mirror is very flat and smooth, and so it bounces things relatively straight off as far as light, but a handful of glitter, everything is going different directions, and so you get that scatter of light. Same thing happens with radiation. This 1995 study by Barron Brown um, was published in two parts. The, this is part two, which specifically addresses the field drying piece of the hay dry model. Part one discusses the forage quality parameters. The idea of a model that can not only model dry down of hay, but also the changes in forage quality as it goes through dry down is a pretty attractive option. However, as we've seen with others, radiation is a required input, and this can be difficult to obtain, especially in real time. And also, if we've, as we've covered earlier with the different drying ideologies, this paper took the approach of a single layer drying system. And while single layer drying systems have sometimes been considered inferior to the multi-layer drying systems, this study supported a previous study that found that multi-layer drying systems only outperformed single layer drying systems when tedding was involved. This has been touched on briefly in some of the other papers. It's due to the redistribution of moisture that occurs during tedding, and that changes the way that the system dries. This 2004 study by Demetriadis et al. Um, was investigating the drying of a bed of chopped alfalfa in a dryer, which is not necessarily what we're looking for in field drying, but they did make a point that I wanted to mention. And what they were looking at in this study was how when hay starts to lose moisture, 
the pile shrinks and becomes less dense, and that changes its relationship not only with its surrounding environment, but within um, itself. So this presents another challenge in the modeling of hay drying because the system is constantly changing. The final study outlined in this section is more recent. It was published in 2010, and it outlined that each swath essentially has its own microclimate, and we can't make sweeping assumptions about the microclimate within a swath or a field from the ambient environmental conditions. Because there's a relationship between stomatal conductance and solar radiation, it changes over time, and it can't be put in a modeling system as a constant. The stomatal conductance ebbs and flows with the sunrise and sunset and has to be accounted for as such. So since solar radiation or insulation was such an important factor as determined by these studies, I went out searching on the internet for that information. It's not easy to get, I found out. There's one website I found that does have insulation forecasts, but I'm not sure how reliable it is. And they also had a lot of disclaimers about what you couldn't post from their website in talks or papers, so I left out all their identifying information and I didn't take any screenshots. I was able to dig around a bit on their website because I could log in as a student, um, but with a personal email, they required a credit card and I didn't want to put my credit card in. Um, so anyway, what I could tell was you could get access to these solar insulation forecasts um, for $99 a month for your first location and then $50 a month for your second through fifth locations and so on. So pretty pricey. Um, and I'm still not clear on how big a site is that they consider. So other than relying on insulation data collected from satellites, there are instruments that can do it for you. Um, I thought you could get anything on Amazon, but apparently not a peer heliometer. Uh, I had found some on eBay. The price range was pretty large, $100 to $1,400-ish. The lower end could have been just parts, but the ads weren't super clear. Um, I did not reach out to any of the scientific companies for pricing. I was just looking for something that an average person might be able to have or pick up. Um, I did find pyranometers on Amazon, though, which can measure radiation, and each one of the cells runs at least a couple hundred bucks. I'm not sure how many you'd need or what other pieces are required, but I got the idea pretty quickly that it was not a cheap route either. So after seeing how intensive some of the approaches were to this, there was one approach that stood out to me as unique when I read these papers, so I wanted to present it slightly more in depth. This study was done by Hayhoe and Jackson in 1974 and consisted of two parts. In part one, researchers created an index to measure the drying power of the air in a given environment, calculated from daily values of potential evaporation and precipitation. This was done by combining observed field moisture data with accumulated potential evaporation. The index essentially allowed researchers to identify what conditions would make for a good drying day. The authors then used 30-year weather data to estimate the probability of good days for drying hay. When the index was being created, hay was cut every single day during the test period, and moisture was measured each day until sufficiently dry. This was used to determine the effects of the existing weather for each day of drying. The rate of drying for given weather conditions decreases as moisture content decreases, creating a challenge when making a model since the rate is constantly changing. So just to provide some context, this study was conducted in Napin, is my best guess on how to say that, Nova Scotia. The climate is slightly cooler and wetter than ours here in Kentucky. The graph on the right shows the average high and low temperatures for each month. Lexington, Kentucky is in blue and Napin, Nova Scotia is in red. I'm going to show you the table that was created from this study. There is a lot of data packed into a small area, so I wanted to break it down. First, I want to show you the headings that are on this table. This is basically each combination of good and bad drying days that the study investigated the probability for. Because it gets pretty wordy, I decided to change over to this use of symbols. So if you see an X, that's a bad drying day, and the check mark is a good drying day. This is how I converted them. So the far left column, you have the probability of a good drying day following a bad drying day, good following a good, good following two good, and then the last four columns are the probability of one through four consecutive good drying days.
Each of these categories was evaluated for 15 day stretches throughout their growing season. We can see these stretches on the left. They go from the beginning of June until mid September. And here's the numbers. It's certainly overwhelming to look at it first, but for someone using the table, I think it would be quite intuitive pretty quickly how to use it to your advantage. The first column assumes that today, the day we are using the table, is a bad day for drying and lets us know the probability that tomorrow will be better than today. As we move across the table, we increase the number of good drying days that may follow and what the probability is that that will occur. The very last paragraph of this paper notes that this index is best used with a reliable 36-hour forecast. This index can be used to determine the probability that the third and fourth days at the end of that forecast will have good weather. So we can see the first week of July, the third row down, um, you have a pretty good chance of having a couple of good drying days in a row compared to the end of September where you're not very likely to have multiple good drying days in a row. So you might need to be watching that weather a little bit closer when you decide to harvest your hay or you need to have something else as a backup such as a alternative storage method like haylage or maybe the need to use some kind of preservative if the weather's not going to allow you to get that dry down in time. So in my opinion this method is definitely more promising than some of the other methods simply because it does not require that a grower input several measurements nor do they need to take measurements in the field. The creation of this table also took place in a relatively less intensive process than the more complicated models, meaning it may be more feasible to create, especially for different regions in Kentucky. As far as cons for this method of helping farmers with hay drying time, it is still necessary that a grower be familiar with the microclimate of their field and assess the actual weather forecast since it may very well differ from the probability table. So in conclusion, the more I read, the less I feel like I know. <laughs> it's easy to go down the rabbit hole of drying theory and parts of physics that are way beyond me, but there has been some great research done in the past on how to best help growers mitigate the risk um, in growing hay crops. And with the right approach, it might be able to be done in Kentucky as well. Um, drying hay is a very uh, involved and complicated process to model and models would need to be created and tested for different regions in Kentucky due to variation in climate and environmental factors. So simpler may be better um, so that we can produce different models or different systems across Kentucky instead of one intensive one for one location. Um, so uh, one other resource that I want to point out to you is the UK Ag Weather Center. This is a resource that's freely available to anyone, and the website is here in this gray box, weather.uky.edu. And if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, I have it blown up on the left as well, you can see there's a drying conditions index for each day. And I believe that goes by county, so um, that's at least something that you can look at to help you make your decision about uh, cutting hay. And finally, I appreciate your attention and I am more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. And of course, here is my work cited.